Tyler the Creator, ladies and gentlemen, the album is Cherry Bomb. Why is it called Cherry Bomb? Uh, that word looks sick. That and was when it. you say it, you know what it is. Got it. All right. Because I, I was definitely wanted to have the conversation with you about the songs on the album. Go ahead, Ebro. Um, Death Camp. Mm-hmm. I listened to Death Camp. I didn't hear you mention Death Camp or anybody dying on that song. Uh, there was so no camping. Camp, there was no death. Last time I was in New York, I uh, I went to a bookstore to get some books and shit, and it was a book called Death Camp. Mm. And the way that that word looked on and centered in the book was so cool to me. Caught you. And I was, I was always like, I love that word. And uh, I made that song. Who doesn't love the word death camp? Death it's so camp. positive. <laughs> it, it just feels nice when you hear it. It just looked, I just liked death how I camp. looked. And uh, um, I named it that. Buffalo. Buffalo, I listened to that song. Wasn't about the wings. Wasn't about the city. Wasn't about the animal. Not at all. That I, I, like, I just like that word. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a theme here. Now. I did listen to Find Your Wings, which had Mm -hmm. something to do with flying Mm -hmm. and like finding yourself and you finding yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh Uh-huh. So I was kind of like, all right, this makes sense. I get it. You look at song titles and then try to fully find out. I'm trying to follow along here. Like I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to understand. It's not as deep. Blow My Load was definitely blowing loads. Yeah, for sure. That's just gone. It's there. It's all in there. Yeah, he was focused on that one. Um, the brown stains of dark keys. What is that? Latin. No, you keep keep reading the, the title. No, 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 no. You got to say no, the title. What's the, what's what's the, the full title? song called? Dark keys Latifah, part six through twelve. Remix. <laughs> I don't know enough about our future to know oh if dark keys Latifah was a reoccurring character. Okay, so. Me and Q made this song. I, I didn't have a song title for it, so it was it was I think it was me, Lionel, Kelly, like one of the person. I was like, "Yo, what should we? We should name this song the blackest name we could think of." <laughs> so we were literally trying to think of like 1930s like nigga names like Leroy and shit. And um, I was like, "What's what's uh? Let's think of something way funnier, but nigger." And then it was like Darkies. And I was like, what's the gross last name? Latifa. It's just those syllables. So and I was like, what if we just called the song The Brown Stains? Like shit. And then he was like, oh, The Brown Stains, Darkies Latifa. And he was like, yo, I should make an extra out title with like, it was originally called The Brown Stains of Darkies Latifa, part six through 12 remix, Rodney Jerkins, Dark Child Club Mix. <laughs> But I cut it short. <laughs> oh, I love the and, Dark Child Club And mix. that was full on just to hear people yeah. be like, yo, dude, the answer song the time here is funny. Dark just so I can get a giggle every time they say it. Funny. Got it. Got it. Um, Two Seater was on point. I, I thought it was, you know, fairly on point to the title. Like you, there were some car references in there. Is this a new thing we're going to do on the show where you just go through albums and decide? I only decide? do this with him. That's I only tight. do this with them because yeah, I try to follow along. Two Seater's about a car. Yeah, like yeah. there's some the car thing like thing. That makes sense. You know what I mean? Um, and then Oga, o- Okaga, California. Is that a real place? No, in my head at least. Okay, so enlighten yeah. me because I definitely Googled it. I was like, maybe they do like a show nah, there or something. Nah, it's nothing there. there. What did you come up with when you Googled it? Nothing. Well, mm. Tyler created nothing. Cherry Bomb. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> you found a link back to the album. <laughs> back to <laughs> what you were listening to. Yeah. <laughs> so what is what happens in this place? I don't know. You'll, you'll know in a couple years. Oh, see? Oh. See? Understand me. All right. You know what I mean? See how he's looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> see? Knowingly. Um, um, I, yeah, I was, uh, y'all said um at the same time. Yeah, that was, was so yeah. crazy to me. Anybody else catch that? That was crazy. Yeah, that almost mm-hmm. bare. It was literally like the hey, exact same Hey, Tyler, thing. earlier when you were doing the freestyle, you mentioned something about people coming at you because you're not rapping about sad shit. What was that about? Yeah, dude. It's crazy. I realize people love when niggas is really not feeling good. I no, guess Misery they're Loves not. Couple. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, I, uh, every album of mine sounds different. And, um, I'm realized, uh, a lot of, I'm, people love, like I said, when people are sad. People could relate to that shit where they are in their life with music. People relate to music, if, if it's not like when it comes to lyrics. And on this album, I'm talking about jewelry and cars and, just being happy and just loving life. It's nothing sad on there. Yeah. 
And I'm realizing it's hard for a lot of people to relate to that because maybe they're just not there in their in their head and right. it's hard for them to get into it. And yo, what the fuck happened to you, dog? Like I like answer where you cried about your dad and then this song where you were sad and when you were broke and shit. And I'm like, yeah, dude, like that was cool four years ago, but like life is really cool right now. And I'm one of those artists where I'm you're gonna know where I'm at in my life based off my music, so, like no matter what. And I'm really personal on this album, but it's not in a in it's not in a sad like. Yeah. Well, that's not where you are. Menacing way. It's like I'm telling you what's going on, but I'm doing it in like a a a more a more a brighter way. And a lot of people don't like that because they can't relate to it. Well, and also people don't like rappers to be happy specifically. Yeah, they like Sp- you either they- shooting other people or you crying about black power or your uh yeah just like, like a lot of people don't want us it, it's so crazy i think you it's would the think nature niggas of rap would be though. happy but it's the that, nature of rap though the nature of rap since it's quote unquote street music i think there's that um stay gutter stay hood don't sell out and it's like no like that shit don't inspire you like Seeing niggas I look up to. I was watching a Faith Evans video the other day. Of course you were. And P. Diddy was in there fucking dancing. I was like, damn, he was a young dude, but fuck, he was killing it. Like, all right, like, it's putting pressure on myself. Like, damn, he was like my age killing it. I need to step it up. Like, or seeing Cameron with a matching mink and car. Like, that shit makes me want to be better. Or like, when I not like when I listen to P. And he talking about renegotiating his deal with Louis Vuitton and driving an Enzo. Like, that shit makes me feel like, damn, I need to get there. Or, like, that makes me feel like I'm not shit and makes me work harder. Mm -hmm. When I see niggas enjoying, like, when fucking P. Diddy on yachts and fucking uh, Nova Scotia or whatever the fuck he is. That shit makes me feel fucking good. Yes, Jay-Z flex. Like, I love that shit when Jay-Z be flex. But do you think five years ago, because a lot of your fans are probably still in the place that you were in five years ago. You, would, you you didn't see things exactly like that, did you? Of course I did, because it was the same songs I was listening to. Remember, did he you... used to rant and rave about Justin Bieber and just like, remember, I, I was like, wow, I didn't expect these kids to be Justin Bieber fans. Me? I just or not... love, uh, love Pharrell the way they love Pharrell. I love, love that shit, nigga. You could listen to um, you could listen to fucking Lame, number six off the OF tape one from 2008, where I'm talking about I'm rolling in the Beamer looking. I didn't have a fucking Beamer, but I had aspirations to fucking get one. And I fucking got one. And now now that I got that, I'm on to something else. I want McLaren's now meeting the CEOs. Like, that shit's tight to me. And then next, I want an Enzo. Then I want a fucking spaceship. Then I want to fucking own my, like, I'm always trying to just be better. And it sucks that a lot of people don't look at that like, damn, let me get on my shit, you know? Do you, do, do you think that they feel like you're leaving them behind? Like, do they... Like, I'm not leaving them, because my whole album is about, hey, nigga, come. Yeah. The whole album is about, come fly with me. And musically, you didn't jump off a cliff and become some other person that musically Dude, they can't hear? You could literally name a song on this album, and I could show you what the same song on Goblin, Bastard, and Wolf, what I was trying to accomplish. I just wasn't there musically yet. Do you have you um mm-hmm. you were talking about your aspirations business wise? Have you fully recovered from a few years ago when you pissed off a brand and they cut you and it was like a big to do? Even though I thought it was unfair the way it played out, do you feel that you learned from that experience and have dealt with it at all? Oh, he's talking Mountain Dew. the goat. Mountain yeah, Mountain Dew. Oh, Mountain Dew. Oh, yeah. No, dude, that was the greatest thing ever. Why? Um, it was a learning experience. It was um, what 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 angered me was the. The Boyce Watkins thing Uh, with the guy who kind of pushed me getting cut off from that forward. Uh, He he was like a professor or something, right? He was a professor, and he said it was the most racist commercial ever, which scared Mountain Dew, and they cut me off, and then I lost that, whatever. Um, The only thing that saddened me about that was just being a young black kid, um, being in a being as a director being in a position where someone big like Mountain Dew gives me a chance to just do that and not even be in a commercial fucking dancing and shit like drinking Mountain Dew, but just putting my vision in there. And for someone, an older black guy, instead of congratulating me, uh, deciding to look at something negative from it and to just cut off any other opportunities 
from me opening that door for even Mountain Dew to even give me a chance really saddened me. That broke my spirit. Dude, why do you so why much. do you think cause he's I now I I do know who he is and I, I've heard him talk before. Um, you know, I think a lot of older black people and you and I have had the, the debate about the N-word, right? Mm-hmm. Assume that young people, because they're young, don't understand the impact of their behavior later. So he might have looked at your Mountain Dew commercial and said that they gave this young black man a chance and they're letting him sambo or do something racist in this. And he doesn't even know what's happening. But to he him. didn't do that. But he wasn't even but doing see, it. And I didn't understand were, what was racist about it. It was a really, goat because you don't. It's it's people who think negative like that. It's people who s- sought out to. So look what was for, racist yeah, what about was it? Yeah, what was racist about it? To I them, had, according I had, to him. So one of the scenes where the goat attacked someone at a red. It was it was a story. It was a story art commercial. I got I did four commercials. It was a story art. First commercial, the goat has Mountain Dew and he likes it so much he goes crazy. He pushes the lady on the ground and runs out because it's so good. The second commercial was the lady at the police station looking at a lineup of people mm-hmm. saying that that was the goat that 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 pushed me in the restaurant, right? Uh the And those both aired, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The uh now in the lineup, I used a bunch of my friends. Um, they happen to be African American, right? I used Left Brain. Oh, that's I interesting. I used my boy Garrett from Trash Talk. Yeah. I used my boy Arrow, who's been on Loiter Squad, who's been my friend for a while. And I use Lionel, the guy that's standing right here. And a real life criminal should be known here. <laughs> right? None of these guys have records. These are all good dudes who I've been working with. Who are playing for years. a part. You put your Who's friends playing in. playing his characters, and they were and there, there was on a set goat also. also. And there was a goat also. Now, me being a director, no different from how Wes Anderson or Quentin Tarantino, you use a lot of the same people in a lot of your work. I've used Errol and Lionel Continuity. in a lot of my work. Right. So they were there playing different characters in some work that I've done for Mountain Dew. Boyce Watkins saw that and said, this is the most racist commercial ever. How could you have black people on uh, as in, in like as criminals on here? Blah, 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 blah. And then the goat. And then people start picking up this story saying, is this the most racist commercial ever? It got big. The Mountain Dew guys are seeing this like, whoa, we don't want to have this heat on us. Hey, we're sorry that we even put this commercial out, blah, blah, blah. No more Tyler. Cut. I was like, what the fuck did this just turn into? This black dude is saying that my headspace was somewhere where it wasn't. Instead of supporting me and just having my back, knowing where this where this came from, Mountain Dew just cuts me off like everyone's looking at me like a fucking Uncle Sam or some shit. Like, it's I think it's, I think it's I'm Tom. fucking uh, Uncle Tom. 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 Sam is the politician. Sam is the, the fuck. Okay. Okay. All right, right. no, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm 21 years old, like, excited that I could fucking worry about how the orange is in contrast with the green in this commercial yeah. at the coloring session. And now this turned into a big negative debate. Like, it fucked my spirit up so much. Like... I was hoping that that opened a door for me to do commercials for fucking Fat Burger yeah. and then fucking uh, uh, Xbox and then open the door to do a commercial for fucking the monster truck rallies and just all these other ideas Friday, that Friday, I fucking Friday. had. <laughs> and they fucking cut it. Boyce Watkins just fucking said, nope. And, and I mean, a lot of shit. people don't even know this, and I know this because behind the scenes there was a bunch of things happening. That moment, also at the time, Lil Wayne had yeah. a tour that was sponsored by Mountain Dew. So because Mountain Dew is owned by PepsiCo, which owns Frito-Lay, Gatorade, yeah, and all that. Tons mm-hmm. of stuff. They cut off rap. They cut off so much. Period. Completely? So yeah. the Lil Wayne tour got under, like the funding for the Lil Wayne tour, cut. Done. And it got this they had niggas done. apologizing too. Like, I never apologized Did they ask you to shit. apologize? I'm not fucking up. What am I apologizing for? I did nothing wrong. But did and they I'm ask standing, you to? Niggas was like, we should put out a statement. Apo-. I'm not doing shit. And, um... I know Wayne had probably had PR apologize, and that's my boy, but I was so sad. Because I was like, Wayne, you did nothing wrong. You didn't. Don't fucking... Well, and what they did to Wayne was they started then going into his lyrics. So now, right yeah. now, right like, now, today, fuck. if you wanted, if let's say Coke, Pepsi, any of these brands wanted to stand next to an, so, artist, a, a artist, 
they're going to analyze everything the they've ever said. I had someone tell me that Wale's lyrics were too racy to stand next to like Sprite. That's crazy. <laughs> they were like, they were oh, like we lotus flower bomb. Like, what does oh, that mean know. exactly? We don't know. We don't bomb? know about that. But but yeah. So sometimes, and you're absolutely right. Would have been more useful is in, when elders, and this has been a pet peeve in hip hop since C. Dolores Tucker. The gripe that you have, I've had since 1990, yeah. where elder black people don't want to hear or see our young black perspectives, and instead of sitting down with us, they just shut saying, it down. Yo, Tell us about how you feel or how the world makes you feel or why yeah, you're making just this art or with whatever. Me, dog. They go me. out in public and try to embarrass Without us. Without speaking to me or even understanding. He never reached out? He never. He reached out after the third video he put up and shit. Like, after I was already cut and I was just like, what the fuck just happened? And that fuck. But, it's been that, a, but this has been a bit issue with hip hop, politics, community leaders for a long time where the conversation between elder black people in the community and young black people making music and creating, there's a disconnect. And they would rather go out in public and use. Well, that, us. Has, that has personal benefit for them. Exactly. You have to be clear about exactly. that. I mean, that, that well, people yeah, want selfish, to shine. But that, if they but, weren't selfish, they would pull me to the side and be like, look, young dude, I'm wiser than you. I know a couple things. Maybe you could take some from this or not. Just or, explain to me. Or and how about listen. this? Get that check. And then let's go build some other things that help uh, uh, deal with the concerns that you have and the awareness issues that you think young black people have. And let's open up a dialogue. Let's have events. Let's have gatherings. Let's do something constructive with the opportunity, right? And the finances that are coming in now. I mean, look, you're you're pulling, what, 20,000 people a year out to your carnival that y'all put together where it's just a great multicultural yeah, mix man, of people coming together to have hurt. fun like, and eat I'm, candy. I'm doing, I do cool shit, man. Like, I do cool shit. I'm not even, I'm not out here shooting niggas and like fucking, every time, every it's little niggas that hang out like where our store used to be and every time I see them kids and they say bye, I say don't do drugs. I'm out here like, don't do drugs. I'm trying to tell kids like, yo, like, don't fuck up. Like, the whole album is about nigga. You want this car too, you could get it too. Focus, like, I'm out here not promoting fucked up shit. And for someone like that mm. to look past all of that and point out some bullshit but that's, like that, fuck, fuck that. Fuck just, Boyce Watkins. He a bitch. And well, his daughter a fan. That, okay, good. I'm glad it went that way. But yeah, there's always someone out there who's going to look past... He's got his daughter in trouble. Well, nobody said a fan, crying. though. I thought it was something else. No, worse. no, now he's going to go in his daughter's room and... Like, God damn it, are you listening to that Tyler, the creator? <laughs> hey, now, speaking of familial relationships, uh, something I, I think super interesting that doesn't necessarily get talked about all the time, even though you've addressed it in your music, is your relationship with uh, Clancy and Kelly, his wife. It's like I was kind of waiting for this documentary to come out. I always thought there was going to be like a story about it because it's such an interesting relationship that you guys are like basically family. They kind of helped raise you guys completely. I mean, I mean, I'm sure it's calmed down now to the point where before you had all of these kids running around all the time. But talk a little bit about about that relationship in your life. You addressed it on the record when you said my, Clancy, my father figure. But talk about that a little bit in the role that he plays for you right now. Yeah, uh, he came at a crazy time. I remember uh, a lot. You guys probably don't know this story, so I'll make it short. Uh, so it was other is this other dude? So Plain Pat flew me out to New York randomly, like caught me on Fairfax skating around. And it was him and this other guy. Yo, what's up, Plain Pat? Oh, shit, yeah, dude, Kid Cudi shit is cool. Like, I heard you can't tell me nothing mixtape. Like, yay, and like all this other cool stuff. Like, you're cool. Wow, it's crazy you know about me. Hey, you ever want to come to New York for no reason? I was like, uh, sure. I've never been out of California in my life. He's like, all right, come. Uh, so he flies me out, and then I had like 20 bucks. I was going by myself, so Frank came with me. So we came to New York, I'm playing Pat. I get to, I meet Vashti. Uh, I meet other p couple cool people. I meet the head dudes at Supreme and stuff. Like, I, just a bunch of cool shit, a bunch of skateboarders and shit that I look up to. And uh, with him is this other guy who wants to manage me and things like that. And they're just showing me all this cool shit, like just feeding me cake and stuff. <laughs> uh, he gave me a bait fucking cause he always wanted, like just cool shit. And um, this is around the same time where uh, I'm in contact with this dude named David Arauti. And um, at, uh, he used to work for Interscope and shit. Uh, and um, uh, before I go to New York, I had met with Clancy and uh, he was like, yo, dude, look, it's not even about managing or whatever the fuck. Just know that I'm a fan 
and you guys fucking brought some weird energy that makes me fucking smile. I feel 12 again, and I have no problems in the world. If we don't even have a relationship, just know I will support everything you guys do. And this was over the worst hot chocolate I ever had, by the way. I never forget. And this came from the dude David who worked at Interscope because Clancy used to. No, work no, here. no. Clancy said this. I was meeting with both of them. Oh, okay, they were yeah, just yeah, together. Yeah, were together. And Clancy worked at Interscope at the time as well. Uh, you no, nah, he was done. You're already done, but friends with them. Okay, yeah, but he was telling me like, yeah, like I just want to watch y'all grow. It's not about money. It's not about managing it, whatever. And then I go to New York. I come back from New York. Like, oh my, tell my friend, yo, dude, I went to New York. It was, t- it was a plane, and uh, <laughs> it, like, I've never been anywhere. So I'm just like, what the fuck? Uh, I meet with him again, and he's like, so how, like, how you been? I was like, oh, I went to New York. They flew me out, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I was like, what? He was like, look, dude, I could fly you private anywhere you want to go. I could get you any fucking thing. You said private. <laughs> he lied also <laughs> early on. Just be clear. I could take you like anywhere, but it's not about that. I want to watch you grow because your fucking brain is much bigger than doing a fucking little 50 people rap show. Yeah, it's more than that. He's And when he said that and saw that I wanted to do all mm. of this and not just this, I was just like, wow, that dude kind of gives a fuck. It was me and Haji. I was like, that dude gives a fuck. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing with him, he wanted everything that came with it, all of us. He wanted the whole thing where the other guy just wanted me just, wanted just by myself. Yeah. And I was like, nah, dude, like, I'm not leaving these dudes. Like, you either, all of it. I remember we played our first show at the Low End Theory in Los Angeles. They offered us 500 bucks. We split it like five ways or whatever. And um, he drove us to that show, by the way, and almost fucking killed us. We fuck, almost got hit by a truck. He almost killed us. We got the money. We walked, me, Sid, Travis, everyone. We went to Denny's off Crenshaw and shit. <laughs> Damn. We thought we, we went, I remember going to the bathroom, like, all right, y'all here, and like s- splitting that 500, and it felt so tight. That night, the other guy who was going to manage me, not playing Pat, playing Pat's the best dude ever. The other guy called me and was like, yeah, so how'd the show go? It was good. He was like, well, just knowing if I was your manager, I would take this percentage of what you just made, which was only $100. And I'm like, you're, you're fucking Get joking. out of my life. Yeah. Damn. And he was like, but yeah, anyway, uh, I got this spot for you to open up for Lloyd Banks if you, uh, if you want to if you wanna do that. And I was like, Hey yo, let me let me call you back, dog. And I hung up, and I was just like, "Yo, Clancy, let's fucking get this ball rolling." And that from that point on, well, yeah, from that point on, it was like, because I saw where their minds were, and I saw where his head was, mm-hmm. and because of this dude, I'm able to be like, "Hey, let's fucking throw a carnival," and we f- and or or hey, I want to be a centaur with wig. With the wig who <laughs> snorts like a fucking mountain of coke. And you did that. Or let's, I wanna make shoes well, with no, pink soles and shit. No, no, but he did it in the image. No, or I wanna yeah, make, I or I wanna make a, or I wanna make a ridiculous television show that couldn't possibly make sense on TV. At all. And, and get it on TV. And instead of like questioning it, he'll be like, he, he trusts my ideas and we figure it out. And it's bigger than just fucking rapping or selling a t shirt. He, he sees that anything is endless like it's actually it's no end to anything it's no walls for anything i do anything i want and he understands that him and kelly you know and um i really appreciate it it's tight when you look back at how crazy you guys were at the beginning because it was funny we had a conversation yesterday where the station was asking me like well when tyler comes in you know what the label wanted to like do a bunch of stuff when you're here i mean it turns out we're just doing this incredible in-depth interview but they were like do you suck my cock thank you they're exactly and that's actually where i'm going with it they were like well one of the producers here said we want to do a 97 seconds with him which is where like we sit with an artist and they kind of talk about their inspiration and stuff and they're like but we know Tyler can't do that like he's a, and I was like actually I think Tyler now is n- not at all like the Tyler you met four years ago when he first came in unless I get coffee don't get don't do that but can, do you think about when they first dealt with you how it must have been when you were literally psychotic 20 out, 24 hours a day it wasn't that I was psychotic I was 19 okay I can't front I'm kind of crazy but you were I mean it was a lot to handle I'm, kinda, I'm still a lot to handle but I was we were 19 20 
we was excited for everything. Like I was able to go buy stuff, like, and I don't mean like, like I was able to go buy food. Like when you wanted to eat, you could so just buy like, food. Of course, we're out of. We didn't have no fucking home training, like. What was the maddest Clancy's ever gotten at you? Have you has he ever been? I've never seen him angry with you. There have he, been times when I've he's wa- angry right now. I've wanted. There have been times no, when I've wanted mad. him to be angry at you, and he's he wouldn't. Never he been, he's actually never been angry at me. It is. It has been a time where he was like, "Dude." Chill. That's the oh, one. No, 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 no. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh, South by Southwest, like last year, the year before, two years he ago. He fucking, he couldn't take it. I have a photo. We, me, Jasper, Lionel, Travis, we kept saying, uh, uh, we kept saying, Jason Derulo, Jason, like nonstop, 24, wouldn't stop. And we kept saying drywall. Eminem has his verse on Rihanna's song called Numb, where he's like, I'm plastered, drywall. Look me in my drywall. We kept saying those two things like back to back. And he could not take, like he wanted us to stop so bad. He was crying. I have a photo I'm gonna send to you guys. Uh, When are you editing this? uh, Today, tomorrow. Okay, I'm gonna find this photo so you could just place it in the video thing. It's him like, like crying, like, <laughs> like in the you know what I'm. It was that's probably the only time he wanted to. He wanted me to see. Die. That's hilarious to me too, because that same trip, I'm assuming it's the same one. I assumed what you were gonna say he was mad about is when you nearly you were accused of inciting a riot at South by Southwest. I thought uh-huh. you were gonna say that. No, it was you repeating the word Jason Derulo over and over again <laughs> was what actually put him over he the top. Was, yo, it's the the story probably doesn't. Like, it was so crazy to see this adult male, like family guy, like this is a this nigga has a wife and kid, like child, dog, the whole night crying because we won't stop singing Jason Derulo. <laughs> it's, it was beautiful. It, it, that's crazy that that was where he broke and he couldn't take no more. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> 